Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 769. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Congo. Today is November 4th, 2022. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. And we're sitting down on a Friday in front of our webcams to talk about what we want to talk about. That's what this show's about. Whatever Kevin and George can come up with, what they find in the news. And it is quite a season for news. It's here in America. We're going to have a, a political election in a week. Actually, less than a week, next Tuesday. Uh, over in the Church of England, they're discussing uh, the LLF. Uh, package. We'll talk about that, that in the show. There's just a lot going on around this world. George, but before we get there, people want to know, not just the weather here in Florida, which is gorgeous, but how are we doing? How are you doing, George? Well, I couldn't film on Tuesday because we're getting all of our pledge mailings out into the post. And of course, that's uh, always fraught with uh, little uh, fearfulness and expectation. But all the paperwork was sent out and uh, well, we've got a uh, we've got a nut we have to crack next year of about three hundred and fifty thousand, hmm. and that's just what we got to do. Uh, so we'll see how God we'll see what happens. So, well, we will praise the Lord. This is a different time than it was in the last uh, hmm. four or five decades because we have currently a recession here going on in America. The West is having that over in uh, the UK and Europe. They're having a, a recession as well. And according to the Bank of Britain or whatever, England, I'm sorry that was, uh, they're saying this is going to be really bad. And they're, they're predicting that uh, we could go into a recession for five or ten years and maybe hit a depression, which is really sad to see. But that makes it difficult for churches to budget out a year. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if the economy is going to continue to crash and uh, our parishioners don't have jobs anymore, how do we really focus into that, our our budget, and how much of a faith budget are we going to have this year? So um, we'll have to see how that goes. Yeah. Well, we don't do faith budgets. We, uh, we'll, we'll set the budget once the uh, pledges come in, and we know what we're going to, we can expect. And historically, we get about 98% over the last since i've been here last eight years 98 percent of the money pledged shows up eventually mm -hmm. um the, the fear is that uh, mo many of our the average pledge in the united states is almost close to two thousand dollars per household ours is about half that uh we have a lot of people pledging relative to most episcopal churches and we have nobody that is a major you know hitter who gives a quarter of the funds or anything nobody liked that but the uh the fear is for people on fixed incomes they're seeing inflation uh at eight almost nine percent they're seeing uh uh stories they're walking to the grocery store and eggs are twice what they were it seems and gas mm -hmm. is going up and there's a fearfulness and when you're dealing with the mostly older people who give uh they're the ones that basically underwrite the church younger families give less in time when their kids are grown they give more but for older people this brings back some memories of the 70s and the carter era and the uh time when you know i had a fellow tell me like when he first you know he, he can remember buying uh, a CD at getting 14% interest in the early 80s. That's right. Um, and so it's uh, it's a frightening time financially. And we'll, mm -hmm. a lot of it will turn on what happens on Tuesday, the experts tell us. Yeah. I mean, that's politics. That's, you know, kind of the news cycle. That's post-COVID. Uh, our nation and nations around the world have spent, or not spent, have printed $7 trillion extra in the last five years and have been handing that out in the COVID times to keep people afloat. Well, that's what causes inflation. <laughs> and you, you can't just print money and it's come to roost and it's gonna hurt. Uh, the money that people have been saving up in their uh, 401ks and their savings accounts now is gonna slowly decrease, not in value, but in power and strength of the dollar. So mm -hmm. what you, if you have a, a good half million in your account, 
Well, it doesn't buy half a million like it would uh, four years ago or five years ago. And, you know, if you had a half million in your 401k, that half million might be worth, what, 400000 Yeah, oh, or- yeah. To, I, <clears throat> it took, we've taken a hit. I'm sure most of you have taken a hit. Um, that will always come back. It's all, always, you know, in George worked on Wall Street. It's, you know, it's slick. Sl- sl- I can't even say it. Cyclical. There you go. That's the big word I'm looking for. Gosh, it's Friday. That's why. And so um, that's just the way uh, Wall Street works and stocks work. Is you know, it's never down forever. It always recovers higher than it was before it, it crashed. I don't want to use the word crash. <laughs> so uh, l- enough with economy, George. Let's move on to the news. I kind of hinted at the beginning that the House of Bishops in the Church of England has had uh, a meeting this last week over LLF. And we need to step back and slowly discuss this whole topic. And then we'll give our opinion. But you guys need background um, because the Church of England has been discussing the issue of same-sex blessings and same-sex marriages for well more than a decade. What are they going to do? How are they going to do it? And over the last decade or 15 years, they put out reports that have been very fair and said, listen, scripture is very clear on this. Um, Church history is very clear. Uh, Traditions are very clear. We can't go there. We're not going to go there. But slowly over time, there's been more uh, crumbling of that wall because they always go back and say, we'll, we'll continue to discuss it. We're going to continue to talk about it. Well, over time, more liberal people get into higher positions. There's more rot in the church. There's more uh, heretics in the church. And they get to talk about it too. And we find ourselves on November 4th, 2022, talking about what they talked about, George. And we should also say to our English viewers in particular, better games are being played, Mm -hmm. essentially to discourage traditional and conservative-minded clergy and lay people. There are deliberate games being played. And we'll go into the details and let you know what what we've seen and what we've heard, but This past week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the House of Bishops of the Church of England met in a closed session, and they discussed the the living and love and faith uh, process, where there have been consultations around the country and and studies and papers, and they talked to liberal groups, they talked to conservative groups, and the idea is to sort of bring up to speed the Church's uh, stance on same-sex marriage, same-sex blessings. The communique from the bishops' meeting was very bold in the sense that uh, we met we, we uh, at this time and this date and this place. We met in small groups and we discussed the Living in Love and Faith document. And here's the public agenda. But no disposition of their talks was printed. So it was and, just and another... They have not released the, the Living in Love and Faith document either. You know... We, well, it, it, the, uh, well, the living in love and faith is an ongoing. It's, it's not a document in the sense that you know it's a paper being written, but it's a process, not okay. a paper. And the, the original living in love and faith document, the sort of guides discussions, that's been out. But yes, Kevin, you're correct in that there's no final document and there's no final disposition. Well, on Thursday night, Paul Handley who I know I know pretty well professionally. He's the editor of the Church Times. Paul released a story based on sources within the Church of England's College of Bishops, where Paul essentially said that the status quo will not hold, that there will be gay blessings, gay marriage in some form. That was the, uh, uh, I believe, a way of forcing the issue. In politics in the United States, sometimes the networks will call an election early, and the argument is that, well, they're trying to discourage people. We had this in Florida in the Al Gore, George Bush Jr. election in 2000. uh, Yes. Florida was very close in that year, and the networks called it for Al Gore. Now, Florida has two time zones. The panhandle is in the central time zone, and a number of networks called the election for Al Gore before the polls closed in the panhandle. 
And critics of the network said, well, this is an attempt to discourage people who would have gone out to vote for George Bush not to go out and vote because what's the use? Our guys won and I don't want to stand in line. The Paul Handley leak from, from bishops in the Church of England, I believe, is a form of that. It's a ploy. It's a ploy to discourage traditionally minded people from fighting anymore and really to basically give them an, uh, a reason to quit the Church of England and join the ANIE or whatever other group they might be interested in. From the Catholic Church to the uh, various Orthodox groups to the various independent groups. Uh, my take is that this is a ploy. And why do I say that? Because Justin Welby, before the meeting, put out a uh, tweet saying that unity, unity, unity is what we're striving to do. And by couching it in terms of winners and losers, the Church Times leak was basically trying to break the unity, break and keep the both the liberal activists and the conservative activists on board, which is what Welby wanted not what the liberals want. They want a winner-take-all system like we have in the United States, in the Episcopal Church. Well, I think we have to really back up and understand for the last 30 years when something this important has been discussed, it's not been a fair discussion. We've always mm -hmm. given the benefit of the doubt to the liberals, saying, well, they're going to have a fair and honest debate about this. They're not going to try and work behind their backs. Um, we're going to speak face to face, Christian to Christian, brother to brother, and, and work through this. And then when we come to an answer, they somehow convince us to keep talking about it. You know, okay, we're all done. Yep, we decided we're going to not have same-sex marriage in our church. We're not going to um, have, <laughs> um, you know, same-sex blessings. We're going to uh, understand exactly what science says, anthropology says, um, the church says, and, and stick with the good status quo. But we need to keep talking about it. Last night, Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, released a 52-page paper where he argued for same-sex marriage, same-sex blessings in the Church of England. This is the first major bishop, uh, diocesan bishop, if you will, to break ranks and go public with his views. Now, it was no surprise what his views were, but he is basically breaking ranks with Justin Welby's unity call by putting out a document that argues one point. Now, the arguments put forward in Stephen Croft's paper are those of sociology and pastoral care. They're not scriptural. He, in other words, he acknowledges the statements about scripture, but offers the argument that we in the United States have heard it for many years, which is that, you know, they didn't understand homosexuality in Paul's time, the way we understand it today, mm -hmm. uh, it was homosexuality. Uh, what Paul writes about in uh, Pornia and uh, Thade, uh was more power than emotional spirit, love and relationships. Well, of course, that's been thoroughly debunked by uh, classicist and uh, biblical scholars, so that it's not really. Uh, in the academy, it's not really a serious argument, but nonetheless, we hear it brought up by non-specialists again and again. Well, so it's, we a, it's a serious discussion in some very liberal seminaries, but yes, as it, you said, it's been completely debunked by theologians and um, you know church historians uh, for more than a decade now. Uh, the uh, usual refrain is that Jesus said nothing directly about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. That is not necessarily true because if you read through uh, what Christ said about human morals and you read his statement he had not come to, he came to fulfill the law not to overthrow the law um, the assumptions that Jesus speaks in are ones that affirm traditional marriage far from uh, the modern notions of romanticism driving marriage and whatnot. So it, it's a false argument. Robert Gagnon has written about this extensively, and I'm not going to be able fact, to succinctly I, I've summarize. Been, 
I'm going to link to his website because you and I could be talking about this for hours. He, he's done all the the the, the yeoman's work on the this, heavy lifting. The heavy lifting. But you will hear you will hear this statement, and I'm uh, sure there's going to be comments on our Facebook and on the web on the YouTube. Well, Jesus said nothing about uh, gay marriage. Well, he said nothing about cannibalism, cannibalism or insider trading. or incest. Uh, you, you, you go for the list. Jesus, yeah. did, Jesus, Jesus didn't say a lot of things about stuff that the Hebrew, uh, the Torah, the law was quite clear about, mm -hmm. and he did not overturn them. Um, well. After this, the Bishop of Worcester and his assistant, the Bishop of Dudley, John Inge and Martin Gorlick, put out a letter to their clergy saying they support and encourage the Bishop of Oxford's stance and they encourage people to follow up. So we had three bishops come out publicly in favor of gay marriage within the Church of England. We had three conservative statements of note already in opposition. The first was a statement by the Church of England Evangelical Council, which essentially they put out a press release, which they emailed to us, and they totally repudiate the argument put forward in uh, uh, Stephen Croft's paper, saying, you know, it's it's a sociological argument. It's uh, let's make people feel good argument. We, we are Bible Christians, and if we start playing with this Bible uh, and just say, okay, we're going, to ec we're going to cross out what we don't like because of the modern mentality, then we're not Christians. The Oxford Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship put out a statement, and the biggest piece was by Vaughn Roberts, who's the rector of St. Ebbs, who's a celibate gay man who does not uh, support the gay marriage agenda within the Church of England and the wider church, and he wrote a detailed rebuff using scripture and whatnot. We've gotten comments from a number of English clergy on this. Some comments are that Vaughn Roberts is just too nice. He is essentially giving the benefit of the doubt that Bishop Croft is acting on highest motives, that he's giving him the benefit of the doubt. and. It's been pointed out to me, and we've reported on this a number of times, Bishop Croft has had problems with abuse cover-up. He's not particularly popular in his diocese. He's not a nice guy in the way he works with his clergy. And it may be a gentlemanly thing to do to give him the benefit of the doubt, but those with experience of Bishop Croft are saying that's a mistake. Uh, we've had clergy from, uh, well, from the Worcester Diocese who's saying, you know, if we go through with this, I really have to reconsider my position in the Church of England uh, because I can't in good conscience uh, betray my ordination vows, uh, betray that living word that I know from Jesus Christ. So, but this is exactly, I'm going now offer my opinion, this is exactly what the liberals want to do. They want to discourage people, they want clergy to throw up their hands and walk away. Now, the Church of England Evangelical Council and the Oxford Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship say, we're going to fight back, we're going to push back. The battle's now joined. This is the best they've got? Okay, we're going to hit back. But the liberals want to scare people and run them off. Well, and we so Friends hold fast is my argument. I support the, the positions that the, the Diocesan Fellowship and uh, the Church of Even England Evangelical Council puts forward to fight back. Yeah. Don't roll over. Uh, we are in this position, though, where we just had new bishops uh, consecrated uh, of the GAF contradiction. You know, mm -hmm. AMIE, ANIE uh, has had two more bishops. There is now a growing presence of an alternative to the Church of England. And there is there is that, but he, the, here's the here's the kicker. There, um, American clergy are. I make more than the Archbishop of Canterbury does, and I am not an overpaid clergyman. Mm -hmm. I mean, my stipend is set by a scale, and the clergy in the United States are paid two, three, four times what they're paid in the Church of England. And the big battle in the hearts of many people 
when the problems came 10, 15 years ago was my pension, my salary. How am I going to pay my children are in college? I, I need this money for next year. Health insurance. Well, health insurance. And England, the, the clergy are very badly paid. And there's not the, there is the state social support system, but there's not the money flo flowing around. It's not that we have all this inherited wealth that pays my salary. As I mentioned, every dime that goes to run this church, including my salary, is contributed by parishioners. Uh, because we are, in an English setting, we're a chaplaincy, where people of like mind come to worship and support the work of that place. England, they don't have that real sense of, uh, I don't see the money being there according to the, to make things a smooth transition for people to jump from A to B. They, I well, thought, well, who was it you cited that, uh, Kevin, you had, you talked to an Englishman who had, you know, the way people look at the Church of England was like the library, public library oh, yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, was it Bray, Gerald Bray? Was yeah, that that's it? it. That's the one. Yep. I did an interview with him. He said, yeah, it is different over there. The churches are different, but they also have a, a severe priest shortage as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's a priest who served not just one or two parishes, but up to five or six. And mm -hmm. that there's so many difficulties now that you want, you have the, the priest shortage, and now you want to play with doctor. Okay, mm -hmm. see what happens. Um, and I, I agree with George right now that, you know, the liberals are trying to fool you. Don't give them the benefit of the doubt. But part of me says, you know, Church of England, if you're going to do it, do it boldly. Don't play around here. Fully support and endorse same-sex marriages and same-sex blessings. And you stand up front and you say, we're going to be the church that does that. Because there's an alternative now uh, that, that's growing and... But if, if you aren't going to be that bold on it and you're just going to uh, pussyfoot on this and, and say, we might do something, we're thinking about it, don't do that. that that's an embarrassment to faith. Uh, one of the things. Bold or go home. One of the things Croft said in his paper was that we have to make provision for alternative Episcopal oversight for those who can't, in good conscience, follow me into the gay marriage uh, room. Now, the problem is, we've heard this song before on uh, the women's orders issue, mm -hmm. that those who are opposed will have a full place within the Church of England in their life. They will not be discriminated against. And what we have found in the past 20 odd years is that they are heavily distributed against. They are not uh, off put up for preferment. They are basically encouraged to uh, take early retirement and if history is any guide and it's the same people as in charge now as it was then uh, those who opt out of the system or offer an honorable uh, no they're going to be victimized and uh, within the church world persecuted and it may just be the archdeacon uh, it may you know it may not be the bishop or this or that but no, hold on. The church, we, the, we the can, hierarchy we, is not proven to be trustworthy. Right, but we can name three or four, six or seven bishop candidates who are passed over because they're conservative, in, you know, for mm -hmm. conservative diocesan jobs. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, well, it's uh, true in the United States in the Episcopal Church. I mean, uh, I know myself included uh, people who are very competent, very capable, who could never be. Uh, elected bishop because you need the support of the rest of the church and you know do I uh, support the national church's position on same-sex marriage of course not and there well he's not going to uh, it's you know look what they're doing to Charlie Holt in Florida mm -hmm. Charlie has tried to carve a middle way saying I'll be faithful to Florida's statutes which don't permit same-sex marriage and gay clergy and I'll be faithful to the national churches and I'll find a way to sort of farm people out who want to do this and that's not good enough that's not good enough for the liberals and they okay. want to block Charlie Holt from being bishop okay. what do you do with somebody like George and the dozens of other clergy like who think like I do who say no I'm not going to play that game because this is a first order salvation issue but even if you're in a diocese that elects and supports you 
they don't want to fight it's not worth the fight for them they nobody wants to go through another mark lawrence situation where you put up a candidate and you have to redo the whole kit and caboodle because of 815 and not getting uh the permission from all the other dioceses so but here's here's the kicker kevin because we now have a system where bishops by and large are fairly mediocre company men bishops really don't set the tenor of the life of the church anymore especially in the episcopal church um we have a candidate from for election in central florida who comes from colorado colorado bishop she's a nut job she's got a three-year-old and she's telling her clergy that her child is dealing with gender issues um and you know this guy who's a candidate here uh says you know god what an I, I can't want to escape to central florida <laughs> where people are normal and the weather's nicer it's uh, no skiing but uh <laughs> no no ski it, it's not colorado at all i mean and uh, yes yeah the episcopal church and the church of england have been completely diluted um especially at the leadership level and now they want to play with doctrine so um let's move and we also well, kevin, kevin there's there's one, one other thing we should do it what is the story without giving a good slam to justin welby uh, and, he's a nice guy he means well, well better, you know benefit of the doubt type person if you remember the lambeth conference the global south put out a paper asking people to support lambeth 110 Mm-hmm. And with there was a one female suffragan in the Church of England who wrote on the bishop's list, sir, for the Church of England. Hey, this is a great idea. Let's all sign it. She's immediately sat on uh, by her diocesan and by Bishop Welby that you know, don't you dare break ranks. Don't you dare, you know, divide our group. It's okay for the Bishop of Oxford, the Bishop of Worcester, the Bishop of Dudley, and in the past the Bishop of Buckingham. Uh, to make these uh, calls for Bishop full of inclusion London. of gays yeah. and lesbian, yeah. but uh, it's not okay for traditionalists or conservatives yeah. to do that. So what the we get back to the old Sherlock Holmes story, the the, no, the sound at night, the do, you know, dog, the dog in the night, the dog. What did the dog do in the night? The dog did nothing in the night. Hence something suspicious. Justin Welby's not barking at those who are breaking the unity of the house of bishops why is that now he may come to it in a few days but he's always been very quick off the handle and when conservatives look to be breaking the unity of the house of bishops well but if i'm looking to the future if if i'm justin welby i kind of want leaks like this i don't want Mm -hmm. leaks that say people are divided i want leaks from bishops who are saying it's time Seriously, mm-hmm. the society's already gone to hell. Why can't we? You know, and so you kind of want these type of little letters to, to break out. And uh, like I said, you, you, Martin Luther said this <laughs> sin boldly. I mean, don't go halfway on this. I'd be very disappointed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you and I are talking about the, the future of the Anglican Communion without the Mother Church. This will make that happen faster. Um, you know, the, the yeah. Global South is poised to do something else. GAFCON can't wait to watch the Global South do something else and just cheer Justin on. So. Well, Justin Welby has two projects ahead of him. One is shepherding the Church of England to a resolution of this conflict. Huh. And Welby's call is uh, unity. Remember about three, four, it might have been five years ago, Colin Coward. Uh, our friend, uh, and uh, but uh, someone with whom we disagree on just about everything, but he's a nice guy. Nice guy. Said he met with the chief of staff, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Archbishop of Canon, David Porter. And Canon Porter told him that Austin Welby is willing to lose the 20% on either side, the far right and the far left, to preserve the 60% of the Church of England to take it forward. And so that's Justin Welby's long-term stated goal, to preserve the central core. And the other thing is he wants to coron- he wants to lead the coronation of King Charles. And when he gets those two things done, he's got till the age of 70. And so after that, he can just coast and leave the mess to the next Archbishop of Canterbury. Who, God forbid, I hope, isn't uh, 
with the Bishop of London. But hey, <laughs> hey we never know. I, I would not be upset if it was because I see a, a different future for the Anglican Communion, uh, sans without the Mother Church. Let's move on to some other topics, George, and see what's mm-hmm. out there. Um, oh, there's plenty out there. <laughs> there's plenty. Well, our, our next section, we'll talk about a uh, uh, special Indian corruption sp- section. Because both the northern province and the southern province of India have their archbishops under investigations for corruption. And why not? Let's talk about it, George. It's a special week in the Indian Christian world because the, bish- the, the moderator of the Church of North India, P.C. Singh, He's in jail right now. He was refused bail. Uh, He's accused of uh, stealing from his diocese over the last 10, 15 years, pocketing tens of thousands of dollars. And he was arrested when he got back from the Lambeth Conference after a long vacation in Europe. And the police went into his house and found boxes of cash. I mean, we're talking like you know, uh, Scarface and uh, Al Pacino type settings, you know, with boxes of money around the house. He and now the feds have gotten involved and he's being investigated for money laundering because he's stolen all this money, but he's got to hide it from the tax man. And that's money laundering. And coincidentally, the the bish, uh, Bishop uh, Raja Dara, Daras, Bishop Rasalam the moderator of the Church of South India, he also is in police custody this week on money laundering investigations. If you remember, we've reported he got in trouble for selling admissions to, to one school. of the church's medical school. Yeah. And in India, like the United States, there are parents who are willing to fork over a hundred grand to give your kid a career as a doctor. Uh, half the doctors in this county seem to be from India. And I, yeah. so, <laughs> just saying, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people will invest in their kids' future. And this bishop has been pocketing the money, selling seats to the uh, me- medical school. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just like the feds got Al Capone on income tax evasion. The feds in India, the enforcement directorate of the Department of the Treasury, are getting the two archbishops or moderators of India, north and south, on money laundering charges uh, because they've got to do something with this cash that they're stealing. So we'll see now they've not been convicted we have to say that but uh, it is interesting nonetheless that this is the lead story the the uh well f- for me it, it's interesting because i remember five or six years ago there were rumors that gafcon wanted to to have a relationship with some indian diocese or uh province and i don't know what but i i through my inner channel voice said no you don't it, it they may say they're not corrupt but you know, it's it's built into the society, and until mm-hmm. the church reforms itself, it can help correct society's corruption uh, in India. It, it's decades away before Gafcon uh, or the Global South is going to want a serious relationship with a Indian diocese or province. You know, decades away. So, all right, yeah, Indian corruption stories are are, are big nowadays, George. Uh, we talked last year about the Free Church of England being investigated by a charity foundation for where its money went after they sold the church, and uh, there has been an update to that story, George. Yes, last year the Free Church of England sold a closed parish in its northern diocese, and the money was taken into the general coffers of the Free Church of England. The trustees of the closed parish objected, noting that the trust that set up the independent of the parish in the north uh, said that if it's dissolved the money should go to the support of the local poor in the community local church well the free church the free church really didn't do that and there was a very small but very violent twitter uh facebook uh youtube anglican comment ink store. comments anglican, anglican, all yeah, tied anglican. into anglican inks reporting on this where yeah. the wife of the primus is making hysterics whereas the accusers are making hysterics back and forth and uh it was a mess and 
It was amassed and referred to the police and the Charity Commission, which is the regulator of public charities. And the Charity Commission last month released its final inquiry, finding that there was no malfeasance on the part of the leadership of the Free Church of England. So that story has reached its conclusion with emotions are high, tempers, feelings were hurt, but there was no wrongdoing on anybody's part. Found to be innocent. I like that. Um, can, can, can we do another uh, corruption story, Kevin? Please, please, please. Hold on. I like all, right. all right, go for it, George. This is this is Friday, free for all. Another one. We've been reporting about Bishop Brighton Malasa of the Diocese of Upper Shire. It's spelled S-H-I-R-E, Upper Shire, if you read it. He has been at war with his clergy and the diocese for a number of years. And he's accused of fathering children out of wedlock, pocketing diocesan money, not paying his clergy, the usual bad bishop stuff that you read about in Africa. Well, the Nash, the province of Central Africa did an audit and the results were given to the bishops in January. In April, the bishops said to Bishop Malasa, we're giving you six months to find a new job, but you're out of here. Well, this is the million bishop dollar Malasa, bishop, right? This is the million dollar yeah. bishop. The bishop said, okay, I'll go, but the canons say that if I go, I have to be paid until I would otherwise retire. I'm 46 years old. I retire at 65. I need at basically a million U.S. dollars, over a million U.S. dollars, or it sounds better in uh, Malawi and Kwacha, a billion Kwacha to go. And of course, the church diocese doesn't have it. And we had to make a correction because we had reported that uh, the diocese wanted to pay him off to go away, but didn't have the money. And one of the other Malawian bishops said, no, 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 uh, we're, <laughs> we're we don't pay. have the money. That's true, <laughs> but we're not going to pay him anyway. We've got to. And so we corrected that. It was Bishop, yeah. the bishop who was pushing the story that he wanted the million. Well, the primate, Albert Chama, said, okay, I'm going to need to meet with you and your standing committee October 14th, 15th, because your time's almost up and you've made no efforts to find a new job or go away. Well, he flew to Zamba, the Archbishop, and Bishop Brighton Malasa was a no-show at the meeting. And then Albert Chama did what I call an Elon Musk. He fired, meaning he, excom he excommunicated Bishop Malasa for not coming to the meeting. So now they don't have to pay severance. Now they don't have to pay this million dollars because he was removed for cause for directly disobeying the Archbishop. Just like, like Elon Musk saved a hundred million dollars by firing Twitter executives for cause rather than just saying, oh, I don't need you anymore, goodbye. I'll so here's that. a, it's <laughs> this story, which has been percolating for years, has reached yeah. its conclusion yeah. where Albert Chama has uh, dumped the Bishop of Upper Shire. All right, next story, W20, R20, and the Archbishop of Nigeria was asked to be a speaker. And before this, I didn't know what W20 was before George told me so. I'm going to really defer to George on this story, but it's was, an aerosol can that you spray yeah. to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no it's WD WD40. That's WD forty. That's um, WD forty. It's it, it's nice to see an archbishop stand up and really come against um, the violence in his country in a speech. So, George, lead lead into this, please. The R twenty is a gathering of the leaders of the twenty top nations or so, uh, industrial nations, mm -hmm. and that meets every few years. And the W20 was formed recently of leaders of world religions who will offer advice and counsel to the R20, their sort of take on the world issues. And the R20 met this past week in Indonesia, Yogyakarta, and it had representatives from all the world religions. Archbishop Henry Ndakuba, the Archbishop of Nigeria, the Anglican Archbishop, was the keynote speaker. He was the representative of African Christianity at this meeting, if you will. Uh, the collective soul of African Christianity was Henry Ndekuba. And in his speech, Henry Ndekuba said that militant Islam is, engaged, is waging a war of genocide against Christians and moderate Muslims in Nigeria and across Africa, from Mozambique 
up uh, into the Sahel. And the hot spots right now are Nigeria and the Congo and Mozambique. But you Muslims and you Muslim states really need to get your act together and clamp down on jihadists because Islam is now synonymous with genocide. Yeah. So several things here that I take away first, and I'm very grateful that I've just been sent a copy while we've been here of the speech, so I'll be able to report it in full, not just the summary. But Henry de Cuba is speaking truth to power, if you will, because at these multinational world things, uh, you know, like the UN, nobody raises the topic of the persecution of Christians. UN Human Rights Council, oh no, it's all about beating up Israel. It has nothing to do with actual deaths of people, the Uyghur Muslims or the Christians in Nigeria. So Henry and Cuba really spoke loudly, boldly, and clearly. And second, who is speaking for Anglicans in these international global forums? A Gafgan not, Archbishop. Not, yeah, not Justin. Not uh, Justin Welby, yeah, yeah. not Tabo Makoba, South Africa, yeah. not the usual suspects picked yeah. by the Anglican Consultative Council. The W20, an independent group, picks those whom they feel are of most significance and influence. And in the African Anglican world, it was the Archbishop of Nigeria. Hmm. That's a te in other words, it's, it's telling when outsiders make the decisions. Either they're totally ignorant or they know something the insiders don't know. I think both have happened here. Uh, and I've met the Archbishop. I'm not surprised that he gave such a forceful speech. I'm very proud of that. All right. China or Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong, well, uh, let's not do location, let's do China. China jails a Christian pastor for a year because he uh, was not of the best behavior in a courtroom setting, George. And this is a, yeah, it's, it's a small it's, story for us, but it's a big story internationally. Yeah, it's... Uh he, basically, he made rude remarks to a judge in a sedition trial for democracy activists. He was in the he was in the peanut gallery, and he went, <clears throat> you know, boo, you're mean. Well, this Protestant pastor was was found guilty of sedition for insulting the dignity of the court, which was a kangaroo court, you know, persecuting democracy activists, and he was jailed for a year. It's the first time a Christian pastor has been jailed for political reasons in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong's independence, it's done. It's gone. It's basically uh, mainland China is in total, absolute, complete control. All the promises that the Chinese Communist Party made to the British, they're all been reneged. Meanwhile, Chairman Xi, the head of the Communist Party, was elected at the recent party congress to another term. Uh, that's the one where uh, you, you, many of you will have seen the the, uh, the videos of his predecessor being led off and basically being purged, uh, taken from the seat next to the uh, current chairman. And, oh, you're not feeling well? Let's take you to a hospital in the desert in you'll never be seen again. Well, let's see no, if they little... start taking editing the, the photoshopping the pictures. Uh, you know, of the past. That would be something else. That's well, being Stalin. We're, we're, yeah, you know, we're we're at Stalin levels now of persecution yeah. by Xi against his political opponents, mm -hmm. but also against Christians, and of course against the Uyghur Muslims. But it's getting bad for Christians as well. Uh, the uh, Christian diaspora from China is reporting that it hasn't been this bad since the '60s and the Cultural Revolution. And in fact, we can sort of see the official face of Christianity in China is the China Christian Council Three Self Patriotic Movement. It's the state church formed, state approved church formed by the communists when they merged all the Christian Protestants into one church. They they just had their meeting, the, the Three Self Patriotic Movement (CCC), and its president praised Chairman Xi, said that they would continue to work on the Sinocization of Christianity, meaning make it more Chinese-like, and will continue to look to Chairman Xi for their understanding of how to interpret the gospel and live out a Christian life. Because there's no contradiction between the Chinese Communist Party's leadership and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And 
of course, that's why they're removing the Ten Commandments from the walls of some churches and putting up the sayings of Chairman Xi, removing pictures of the saints and putting up pictures of Chairman Xi. Uh, We're back in the bad old days where the official state church is just a rubber stamp for the autocratic dictatorial regime of Chairman Xi and the Communist Party. This is not the first time Christianity has suffered from this problem. You go back to Revelation, you read about the churches um, who need help. This church in China needs help. Uh, it's mm-hmm. it's Christian in name only. Uh, it doesn't have a, a doctrine or a gospel or good news to provide. Uh, and if any place needs the gospel and the good news, it's certainly communist China, uh, where there is no hope. Uh, you are a worker for the state and uh, you belong to the state and you are basically property of the state cat don't knock over that camera i see you <laughs> in many in some ways the, the the crisis facing the chinese clergy of the three self patriots they're not all shills uh far from it it's just the people who rise to the top in these organizations like the church of england are usually shills and charlatans your average pastor he works on the sufferance of the local party and so long as he keeps his head down and his nose clean he can get by but there's going to come a point like it did in the 60s like it did in after 48 when the revolution came by when just that's not enough when you will be persecuted for proclaiming the good news of jesus christ children are no longer allowed in christian churches in china they're not allowed to be catechized or educated so many clergy do this surreptitiously they visit homes and whatnot and in some respects you're seeing that crisis of consciousness for the chinese clergy at what point do i just say excuse me screw the party i'm going to stand on the cross and stand on the faith of jesus christ well at one point do you see the christian church of england ministers say screw the archbishop's council and justin welby and llf i'm going to stand firmly on the gospel for the last 15 years, China's been going through hyper-capitalism, and you could see ebbs of the underground church in China kind of sticking their heads up in the last couple of years to see what's going on. Can we come out now, and uh, if you're going to be hyper-capitalist and you're going to believe it, what the West teaches about capitalism, certainly we can introduce a little bit of Christianity here to China, and you would see some missionaries and some churches try to... to to, well, some built buildings that didn't last long, but try to, to mix into society and mix into the communist society. And they didn't have a lot of trouble with the people in China, but some local governments there really cracked down hard when they saw them peeking their heads out. The, and let me assure you that the underground church of China is doing just fine. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's alive and well, and uh, part of the persecution is the energy that really keeps it growing. So now, some people tell me in the United States that they warned that that could happen here, and I, of course, I don't say, "Oh, that could never happen here." Huh. But if you would have imagined the political tenor of today's times, three, four years ago, oh, it would never happen here. That race relations are worse, the economy is worse, American pride is worse, the military is corrupted, all that stuff. You say, "Oh, you don't be silly." Um, Maybe it's a good thing that we back up on a forest here so that we can have services in the forest in the middle of the night uh, well, if, uh, if the Stasi takes over in Central well, Scout. Let's back up. This is what the communists understand. If they reach the children, they have you for life. Mm-hmm. This is what the liberals understand. And they've taken over our schools, they've taken over our academia and our education. They got the children. And they're teaching the children to hate America and to despise Christianity in, in most religions and to understand that they are little gods. They are little hedonist pagan gods and they can one day decide that they're gonna change their gender. They can decide to change things about them because they've been empowered by the liberal to believe that they have the, the need and desire to follow um, what dissolves humanity. I saw uh, the scripture union in Great Britain put out a little paper saying that 95% of children and young people don't go to church. Mm-hmm. That's that's scary. That's so very scary. Their only knowledge of Christianity is through 
history books or literature or maybe the no. movies? No, their knowledge is through the media. Through the media? Yeah, yeah. And, and through TikTok and through YouTube and through uh, influencers. I mean, the, the, the atheist influencers, the pagan influencers, the hedonistic influencers that rule YouTube are the people speaking to your children. And of course, we're nowhere near that in the United States. But could we be at fifty percent? Could we be at sixty percent? Don't come to ch don't have any Christian foundation. I would say now it'll shy. differ in different parts of the country. Yeah. Here, here in the Hooterville, it's more likely that people will take. It. But you know, I've had something that my friends up north have told me about for years. I've had six kids no longer in Sunday school because the local soccer league now has games on Sunday morning. And for the parents, it's more important that their nine and 10, 11 year olds chase a little white ball, a little black and white ball at 1030 on Sunday instead of being in church. Mm -hmm. um, that Now that's probably been the norm in the Northeast for a generation, but it's reaching down here. And that's a scary prospect. We used to have blue laws for a reason. All right, uh, I don't know if we have time for all the rest of the stories, but we got to cover this one. Uh, Gene Robinson attended a mostly empty uh, church service where he was the guest of honor and speaker, and that was at Falls Episcopal Church in Virginia. We need to talk about that because uh, lots changed in Falls Church, George. I saw pictures and I go, I that must just be the the office staff i don't know who was there because that was a very empty church uh sitting down to listen to gene robertson oh my um falls church lost its property mm -hmm. to the episcopal church and the episcopal church set up an episcopal set up a new congregation in the old building with the new name as well as the old church's money uh falls church anglican is doing quite well it's planning churches several mm -hmm. thousand people uh, on a Sunday, you know, it's one of the mega churches of Anglicanism in the United States, let alone the ACNA. Well, you can't say that about Falls Church Episcopal. Uh, Gene Robinson was invited to be the guest preacher, and Falls Church had been one of the mega centers of oppositions to Gene Robinson as one of the leaders of the evangelical revival in the Episcopal Church. And for him, it was sort of great to go and sort of enjoy the. Uh, the thrill of being uh, in conquered territory. Well, Falls Church, and Jeff Walton has a really good article, uh, which we've reprinted on Anglican Inc., and I encourage you to look at it. Falls Church is uh, running a deficit, an annual deficit of about a quarter, $280,000 a year. They uh, got a lot of money when the church went because Falls Church Anglican had raised money to build education buildings and all this and that and all that money went to the Episcopal Church and the Episcopal Church has been spending that money to uh, deficit spending of a quarter million plus a year f ever since they've been back in and you know the, the rector is gay now Earl Salmon the uh, first gay ordinations in the Diocese of Virginia were there gay first gay marriages were there they've gone really totally into the gay stuff at falls church episcopal and it's fun and the sort of the sad or funny or whatever you want to call it thing is that you can basically get a graph and re find the point when there's no more money left from the anglicans to support uh falls church episcopal and they're going to have to fold their doors i i didn't get, get the heat off I didn't see the title of Gene Robinson's speech. I'm, I'm assuming it's... Uh, oh, it's, his speech was Jesus is a Democrat sort of thing that Jesus okay. believes in social... I mean, uh, usual. Uh, I'm actually proud of Gene that he didn't get into the white nationalism nonsense <laughs> that Michael Curry... Oh, I just have to say, Kevin, we said nobody picked up the Michael Curry story on white yeah. nationalism. Huh? I was wrong. The Georgetown College newspaper picked it up because that's where he spoke. But now the National Catholic Reporter picked it up, and that they even interviewed Carter Hayward and got her take on white nationalism and America. Now, for those who don't know, Carter Hayward was one of the original Philadelphia 11 or 7 first wound priests. She's a lesbian. She's a professor at Episcopal Divinity School. 
She's as post-Christian. She put makes Jack Spong look like Billy Graham. Uh, no, I and, Scout. Yes. <laughs> and she's in retirement in uh, the mountains in Western North Carolina. And she uh, was dug up to give her take on white Christian nationalism and how it's the greatest threat to our democracy. What a mess. All right, let's move on. We got one more news story or two, what we can fit in here. Um, we're at 55 minutes. We got one more. You want to do the Branford Cathedral or the Druids? What do you want to do here? Let's do them both. We can squish right, them together. Squish them together. All right, Branford Cathedral lets a Muslim choir sing praises to Allah. Been there, done that. This isn't the first time this has happened in the Church of England, but it's making the news on Anglican Unscripted for sure. Yeah, this this issue was what forced Gavin Ashton to doubt as a Queen's chaplain when the yeah. Glasgow Cathedral had a Muslim imam give the uh, call to prayer, the Musiens call from the pulpit. Gavin pointed out that, you know, that's not quite right, and he was kindly asked to uh, surrender his tokens of office and not be a Queen's chaplain by the, by the bureaucrats. Yeah. Well, Bradford Cathedral has invited a Muslim choir to sing, and they sing praises and hymns to Allah in the choir stalls. Meanwhile, if you really want to have fun, on November Sunday, November 14th, go to St. Asaph's Cathedral in the Church, of Wa Church in Wales. They're going to have a Thanksgiving service thanking all those who are organ donors. And the, pr and the preacher from the pulpit is a man named Christopher Hughes. And I will read you his title. He is the Anglesey Druids Order's Chief. He's the chief druid of the druids of Anglesey Island. Yes, they're having... Kevin and I made fun of Rowan Williams and we the did. druid honors and all this and that. St. Asaph's Cathedral, in a bid to be relevant and a bid to be inclusive, is having a druid preach from the pulpit. Now, whether they're going to sacrifice maidens on the altar or if this guy's going to paint himself blue and hang mistletoe around the church, I don't know. But well, that's more smart. I get what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> no, no. The ancient, you know, the druids played themselves blue. Uh, yes, and uh, the, but what this tells me is, of course, there's some stupid people in this world, but also there's such a lack of confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ yeah. in the Church of England and the Church in Wales, in many parts of the Episcopal Church, Anglican Church of Canada. There's no confidence that these words are trustworthy and true. In some respects, it's the same issue going back to living in love and faith. Do we believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Or do we believe it just to be a um, mildly interesting historical book that gives us good ideas that we can take or leave? Yeah. It comes down to, do you believe you can be transformed? Mm -hmm. As Paul spoke of. And you can tell that there's churches out there provinces, dioceses, bishops, and clergy who do not believe in the transformational love of Jesus Christ. They believe, most of them, in some type of Gnostic gospel. It's sad to watch. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conga, and you've been watching episode 769 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>